How many of you remember as a child sitting in the driver's seat of your car, the car your parents owned, and you took a hold of that steering wheel, and you began to pretend you were driving, going somewhere? How many of you can remember those first moments sitting in that wheel and thinking, I am driving, I'm going somewhere? I can remember the first time I did it. Yes, I can remember as a little kid sitting behind that wheel. I won't name the age of the car, might date me. But, you know, it was one of those older things that, you know, you grab a hold of the steering wheel and it had that shift on the side and, you know, it had all of those roll down the windows manually kind of thing. Uh, But I was there thinking, wow, I am truly going somewhere. As a little kid, I got a hold of that steering wheel and began to rock it back and forth thinking that's how you drive. Well, some people do. Uh, It's kind of that swervy little thing, you know. Well, you know, I was thinking that's all you do is you kind of rock the wheel back and forth, up back and forth, and that's the way it goes. Yet, I didn't realize that, you know what, I'm going nowhere. I'm actually not moving. Rocking the steering wheel is not really getting me anywhere, nor is it making the car move. It's doing nothing other than just rocking the wheel. It's a great metaphor for us in our lives because sometimes doing what we see others do, mimicking, thinking, oh, that's how the adults drive, you know, two hands on the wheel, you know, I got it there and I'm doing the the driving thing. Uh, You think that's the way it goes. And it's a great metaphor for our spiritual life because sometimes we mimic others and we think, well, all we get is driving our spiritual life, rocking it back and forth, back and forth. That's all it is. It's kind of happy. It's sad. It's up. It's down. It's chaos. It's going all over the place. We're rocking our spiritual life and thinking we're going to go somewhere when really we're not. We're not getting anywhere. So it is, as we look at this be- metaphor, one of the biggest things that I needed to learn as a young kid was some basic things about a car. Some simple basic things. And so it is in our spiritual life that there's some simple basic things that we need to learn about our spiritual life. And it all begins, and the very starting point is really understanding that the power within us is not a personality, but a principle. God within us is not a personality, but a principle little transformational thinking there because we may have thought for years that oh God our father a man a personality with all kinds of uh, characteristics of a human and so we embrace and attach all kinds of human attributes to our concept of God we begin to think of God in the ways that oh well God would certainly laugh at this or God would certainly be looking down with frowning on this God would be ashamed or punished or God would be sad or offer punishment to us over this or that because we've attached so much of a personality we humanize God but God is a principle what's a principle that's hard to understand a principle of understanding that God is truth truth experienced is the divine When we understand that God is truly wisdom, the ancient knowledge and understanding at work within our lives, that's truly what God is. God is law. God is this wonderful promise. The sowing and the reaping is God at work. That is the law of how we live and operate within the world. The spirit of the laws of generosity, of that when we cast our bread upon the water, it comes right back to us. Pressed down, shaken over, it, the whole metaphors of all the scriptures saying to us, this is God. This is God at work. The psalmist wrote, encouraging us to meditate on the law both day and night. Some people think, oh, wait a minute. Are these the Levitical laws I should meditate on? (laughs) Things like I shouldn't wear polyester, eat shrimp. I need to meditate on that more and more. You know, don't sow two seeds in uh, the same soil. Don't wear mixed fabrics. Uh, Don't chew, don't go with girls who do, etc. Things like that. (laughs) And we think that those are somehow the laws we need to meditate. And that's not it at all. The law is God. The principle. Law is the very promise that when we meditate on it, we know the true nature then of the divine. We understand God. We begin to embrace a real comprehension of what God is. And this is our basic foundation for learning to get anywhere within our spiritual life. 
it changes everything when we understand as we release this uh, personality kind of concept that we may have of God, of a being up in the sky, a man sitting on a throne, someone with white hair and a long beard, someone who certainly speaks English because he wouldn't speak any other than the holy language that we speak. And we get this crazy idea that we attach all these concepts around our God too. And when we release them and let them go and understand this is what God is, God is principle. God is this truth ever present in your life, in your life, in your life, in mine. God is this wisdom, infinite knowledge available to you and you and you and you. God is this wonderful law at work that we have such assurance and confidence and such uh, wonderful uh, security in and knowing that when we believe, so shall we receive because that's the law, that's the promise, that's what God is. In our work constantly to humanize God, we sometimes create uh, a way of making us feel more comfortable with God. And that's why so many people are really comfortable with the images of Jesus. He was human. And so embracing that, we say, oh, I feel more comfortable with Jesus. Let me love Jesus. Let Jesus love me. God, mm, I'm not so sure. Because God is the big one in the sky. God is the one who is going to punish. God is, and these concepts then hold us back from moving forward, from getting anywhere within our spiritual life. If you really want to, and you really need to say, I need to put a face on God, then turn to the person on your left and your person on your right. Because you are the face of God. You are the revelation of God. We sing that chorus, you are the face of God. We sing that over and over again because we want to acknowledge that within us, if you're looking for the divine in this moment, right here and now, the face of God is here. The face of God who prepared baked beans and deviled eggs. Martha, for our progressive dinner. The face of God, John and Vance, who provide salads at the progressive dinner. They're providing food and nurturing. This is the face of God in care and compassion. The face of God of Richard, who's working with the Compassion Ministries and helping to facilitate us feeding the hungry and the homeless. The face of God of Sylvia working with the clothing closet and many others. You are the face of God. The praise singers and the singers of celebration and, and instruments. You're creating a joyful sound for all of us. You're the face of God. We look and we say, if you want to know and you really desperately need to somehow personalize God, know that principle, law, Wisdom, all these wonderful attributes of God are at work in one another. And that's where we discover the truth, the depth of God. For we find wisdom revealed, we find infinite knowledge revealed, we find all this wonderful stuff being revealed, and we find the very law that what I sow when I love, Paula loves right back. And I know that. It's not a wonderful principle because the God in her is acknowledging the God in me and we have this wonderful connection where we experience the fullness of what is divine. So this is so important for our lives because contrary, we have, sometimes we have contrary thoughts. We have these thoughts that we've got to get out of that head where they go over and over again and we've got to do some erasing to wipe the slate clean. How many of you ever remember cleaning the blackboards at school? You know, okay, we dated you all. All right, we understand our age group right here and the age dynamics. I can remember as a child being called to say, you know, you got to stay behind recess and your job is to clean the blackboard. I kind of liked that. You know what? There was something kind of fun about that because I got to wipe a whole slate clean and know that the blackboard was clean and ready for possibilities. All kinds of things could come next. How important it is that we begin to release and wipe clean our thoughts and our consciousness of those things that are really barriers for us that are not taking us anywhere because these are crazy thoughts that are rocking us back and forth like a little child holding on the steering wheel thinking we're going to go somewhere. We erase these thoughts. We release them. We erase them and we pour in some new understanding, some new truths, some new awakening that comes to our heart and our life that helps us comprehend and to begin to move forward in that process. We begin to see what it means as we begin to welcome that born again experience. Well, have you been born again today? I hope you have. I hope you realize that I see a lot of people putting on Facebook, hello, uh, you all made up the wake up list or the, the call to life and we all woke up and we're living today. And a lot of people kind of post these kind of thoughts about is a new day, a new chance. It's a new day for us to be born again. 
Start afresh, start anew. Start with a whole new slate of consciousness and a way of thinking to release all others and to welcome the new because this is the spirit of grace. God is so gracious. This principle of grace, this law of grace, this wisdom of grace is available for us. This is no matter what your yesterday was, there's grace. No matter if you had that second barbecue sandwich at the progressive dinner and that extra piece of cake and that a, a scoop of ice cream and four salads, doesn't matter. Because today's a new day and you're born again. We get to start all over on a fresh new awakening. And Jesus invited that you'll say you'll never experience the fullness of the kingdom of God unless you're willing to be born again, to start afresh, to have a new thought, a new consciousness, a new way of thinking. I welcome that every single day in our life. Erase out those old ways, concepts and thoughts that may have held you back and welcome the new which will empower you with a fresh start and a clean state. I want to invite you to a journey of maintaining a consistent, positive mental attitude. Consistent, positive mental attitude. Surrounded by that you live in the realm of truth. Truth is that which is eternal. Truth always has been and always will be. The wonderful truth of love is so beautiful and it's timeless. Love has been around since the beginning of time. That truth that we embrace and we live out, I want you to embrace it and live it consistently and enjoy it, maintain it and embrace this positive power. This is God at work. Understanding, having a mental attitude that wisdom, infinite knowledge is available to us at all times. And certainly a positive, consistent understanding of the spiritual law, that which is God and meditate on that. The very promises, the very principles, the very guarantees for our lives. Now we can trust in that. And when we learn to see God this way, suddenly what rises within us is faith. Because you know what, if we sometimes humanize our God and we begin to think, well, this God could be fickle. You know, love me one day and not so crazy about me the next. Oh, this God may have these human characteristics, like I do, that are judgmental, like we all might say. And we would say, oh, you know, this God may be a very punishing and saying, you know what, this, you deserve to be punished. And we humanize and we attach all these characteristics and then we begin to believe and shape our concepts of God. And then we wonder why our faith is so weak. You know, we say it over and over again here at City of Light. Your faith is only as strong as the level of your understanding. If you don't understand, how will you have strong faith? Because if your faith is, faith is like, well, I don't quite get it. How can I really believe? How can I really trust? How can I really know these things that God is going to be my assurance that God will be there in my time of need? How do I know that? Well, you know, God is wisdom. God is truth. You know, God is law. You know God as these principles, this principle, this is what God is. That you can trust in. When we detach and let go and release and erase all these kind of humanizing that we've done to our God, that's why our faith is limited because it's full then of questions because we question humanity. And we see humanity failing us. And we see the characteristics that are human that we want to attach to God. And those characteristics aren't always beautiful, aren't always cons consistent and loving. Let's go back to that picture of you sitting in that driver's seat as a child, holding onto that steering wheel. There's a few things you needed to learn as a kid, didn't you? Car doesn't necessarily move by rocking the steering wheel. You needed to have a key. First thing is you need to have key in our life, and so it is in our spiritual life. You need to have a key, and that key is your faith. And your faith for it to be strong and dynamic must be grounded on an understanding that God is this wonderful, not human, this wonderful, not being, not, lo not designated to one spot, not living in one destination, universal presence, a principle always with us, never leaving nor forsaking us. There is not a spot where God is not. When we understand all those principles begin to shape our first necessary thing to getting anywhere with some driving faith is that we need the key. And that key is that faith that really motivates us. 
for faith is the power of your mind, the power of your believing, the power of that which you know within your heart and your soul and your very essence. And that power is linked to, the sh to help shape substance around us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, Scripture says. Your faith, the power of your believing, will shape and form that which you're believing for. So if your faith is very weak and your faith is saying, I don't know, and your faith is saying God could be fickle, and your faith says God is withholding, and your faith is saying I don't really know because God may be find, find this funny and not so funny another day, and God may punish and be angry the next moment and love me today. You see, that kind of faith is not founded in this wonderful assurance. Faith is an assurance. It says, I know that I know and I believe. And it has that power then to shape every aspect of your life, to create and to mold. It has a magnetic power in, within it to draw to you that which you desire within your hearts and your life. The scripture says, according to your faith, it shall be done unto you. According to, to the level, to the degree of that faith, how much you put that faith into action and how strong it is. That's why, again, we're passionate about teaching you to be people of great faith. Scripture says over and over again that faith is the foundation. Peter was likened unto the very rock or the foundation that the church would be built on. And Peter exudes and embodies and teaches us and symbolizes faith within our lives. That is the grounding work. We are not going to be any kind of church unless we begin by establishing a firm foundation that we build on that we are people of faith that says, I believe. I believe so much I know. I know so much that I live this way. I know so much that this is how I act and move. And the greatest expression of what I believe is how I live each and every day. Faith then is this mental attitude that has no contradictions no contradictions in your mind whatsoever. Now, that's true faith. Could you believe today for something miraculous in your life? You're healing a new job. Something else opening for you. A life partner. Someone coming your way of blessing and financial uh, prosperity within your life. Can you believe with no contradictions? Wow, what's that look like? If you said, you know what, I believe for my healing and I'm healed and there's no contradictions, how would you live your life? You would live it as if you were healed. If you said, I know that I have a new job coming to me, how would you live your life? You'd dress up and get ready to go to work, wouldn't you? You'd live as if because there's no contradiction. You already know it. You already believe it. You live as if. If there's no contradiction in any aspect of your faith, then then you truly are demonstrating it to its fullest. You're living it out. You're living as if. Today, if you believe that you uh, serve a God of abundance, as we say every Sunday, it'd be not, it won't be difficult for you to write a check in the offering and say, I can give generously. I can tithe. Why? Because I already know, and there's no contradiction, that I live and serve a God of abundance. That as I sow, so shall I reap. If there's no contradictions... But if there are contradictions, then what happens? Oh, it's a totally different picture because we're not ready to live as if, are we? We're not ready to really move and operate in that way because we're going to say, oh, I don't know. My faith says I looked at my bank account and I, I believe in my bank account far more than I would believe in the law, the principle, the wisdom, the infinite knowledge, the almighty, that which is God. Where is it? And so we're really invited to say that we must uh, really believe and have faith that is so powerful for this is the key for us to really move and operate within our worth. And the next thing I want to bring about is, you know, you're sitting in that car, you may have gotten the key, but you got to learn to put it in gear, don't you? You can turn it on, but if you don't get it in gear, it's going nowhere. And sometimes in our life, if you've got all the faith, you got it turned on, but you don't put it in gear. And that gear is to move it into drive and have some driving faith that's going somewhere. Faith that you engage right now. You know, I wish that every life came with one of these little lights that when you woke up in the morning, it flashed and said, engage faith now. 
engage faith right now. Mm -hmm. Begin, please engage your faith. Uh -huh. Start it right now, put it in gear, get your faith going because this is how you need to begin your day. Scripture says, this is the day the Lord hath made. This is the moment the Lord hath made. This is your time to engage your faith. Right now, this very moment, you think, oh, well, you know what? When something really happens, some crisis, I'll begin to engage my faith and I'll work on it then. But right now, I'm just gonna let it go. Why do this exercise of waking up and saying, this I believe, this I'm gonna live as. I'm just gonna go with whatever life gives me. But when we press that button, bingo, engage faith. I put it in gear. I move the shift in such a way that suddenly I'm engaging it and it's operating within me. I'm moving to the fullest in such a way that I understand that the power of faith is coupled with an acceptance, an acceptance that says, I believe and so it is. We say, and so it is a lot. And I hope you don't get so comfortable with that phrase that you lose its meaning. Because a lot of us have lost the power of amen. Amen is the same as and so it is. What does it mean? It's finished. Done deal. Wrap it up. Let's go home. Mm -hmm. And so it is. So don't be shouting and so it is in the middle of my sermon because you're thinking, wrap it up. Let's go home. Uh, <laughs> amen. <laughs> what I'm saying is we know we've got the faith. We've got it within our heart and our life, right? It's alive within us. It's a working and so it is. We know we can move on and we can move in that, some sort, of, that sort of acceptance. It is a, servant, a certitude. It is an assurance that you have within your life. And the third thing you want to know as you were that little kid, you got the key maybe, you learned to put it in gear, you got to press the metal, the pedal to the metal, don't you? You got to give it some gas. If you're going to have driving faith, you got to give it some gas. You know what? What happens is in our lives that our faith will manifest at the level or the intensity that we invest it. That the more you press on the pedal, the more gas you give, the more the car will move and the faster it will move. But it will move at the level of the amount of gas or the pressure you're putting on that pedal, right? You can tap it and it doesn't go much. You can floor it and it takes off. You all know that. How many of you laid some rubber there, taking off once in a while, hitting that gas pedal so hard? Well, that's the kind of faith that we're called to have within our lives. That is an ongoing, driving faith that's moving forward. Faith that says, I believe, I see in mind. We talked about it last week. We're so hold in consciousness. I hold in consciousness. I hold it in mind. I see it and I know it and I believe it in such a way that the answer is already there. I pray affirmatively and I know that my answer is there. And I step on the gas, shall we say, and I give it some extra uh, power in the sense that I raise the level of my believing to a new intensity. I'm giving it gas, so I'm at this point where I'm just pressing forward, and now you're moving. You're transforming your world. You're shaping your world because you're living as if and walking as if and feeding that wonderful faith with such intensity. Because let me encourage you this. Don't desert this wonderful truth. Don't desert this wonderful wisdom. Don't desert this wonderful law. Don't desert this principle in the hour of your need. Because when you do, it proves that you just really didn't know truth. You really didn't know principle. You didn't really know the law. You didn't really know God. That's the challenge. Because when you're in the midst of your greatest need, there's sometimes these tendencies that you want to say, give up, and you want to lift the foot off the pedal, shall we say. And that driving momentum that's going, you let it go and suddenly you begin to slow down because you say, wait a minute, I don't even know where I'm going and I don't even know what I'm doing. Abraham, called of God, the scripture says. In Hebrews, it explains to us, he was called of God to go and to move forward to places where he didn't even know where he was going, but he moved by faith. Abraham became the great example of what its faith is like, saying, I'm not always certain where I'm headed. I'm not always certain where I'm going, but I move every day in faith. I move believing. I take every step because I don't really know where exactly I'm going, but every step is on a firm foundation. And when I put my foot down, it's a 
founded on my faith that says, I know that I know that I know. And my next step is I know that I know that I know. And my next step is I know that I know that I know. And so it goes on as that's how we walk, even though we may not know exactly where we're going. We may not exactly know how God or where God is leading us. And that's okay. Because our job is to simply walk in faith. You can't desert that truth, this wonderful promise. Don't desert it. The children of Israel had come into the promised land and before them was the very first city that they were going to face as they were claiming their promised land. It's a beautiful metaphor for our lives because when we know all that is promised for us of the goodness of God, sometimes our first step in, oh, I'm moving into the all good. I'm moving into the all good. Whoa, wait a minute, there's an obstacle here. And suddenly there's like a Jericho experience, a walled city that seems too great. Archaeologists have said that that wall around the city of Jericho was about 11 feet high and about 14 feet wide or thick. Wow. I've had the privilege to go to Jericho and I've seen some of the ruins and I've seen where the dynamics of what that city may be have been built on and what it may have looked like and some archaeological sketches of what might have been there for Jericho. So the first obstacle is they come into the promised land. Mind you, it's this promised place of God's prosperity and blessing. And they wandered for 40 some years waiting to get there. And now they're there and they've come in, they've crossed the river Jordan and they've moved into this land. And whoa, here's this big old city, this Jericho, now symbolizing a great challenge in their life. And God speaks to them and says, here's what I want you to do. Get out a few bombs, blow the dickens out of them, get some guns, a few tanks. That may have been our way of thinking of how we're going to destroy these walls. And we may have gone in our consciousness, in our way of thinking. But God says, I want you to do something very simple. I want you to march around the city every day for six days. Shh, quietly, quietly, just march. Now you can imagine the people of Jericho, what the blank are these people doing? These foreigners are idiots. They think they're going to take over the city by marching around in a circle. They're crazy. We have this fortress. We have these 11 foot high walls. We have these 14 feet thick barriers. We are dynamic force. And they are doing what? Walking around quietly. Going around. And on the seventh day, Not just once, but they go around seven times. And on the final time, they shout! And the walls come down. Bam! Now you can imagine a surprise for the people in Jericho. They're going, whoa! What did you do? Now we look at this story as a simple metaphor for our lives. How God may be inviting you by faith to do something a little crazy. That may seem out of the norm. They may not say, this is not how it's normally done. Normally, we'd get a tank and blow the dickens out. Normally, we would just, you know, raid them and blow them. We would bomb them. We would do whatever. This is how we do in my way of thinking. And God says, I want to invite you to find a new way, a different way. But you've got to trust and to walk in faith. And I think because this illustration illustrates for us how crazy and how unusual it is and how out of the norm, it invites us to understand this is what true faith is that says, okay, I'm willing to do something that's kind of out of the norm. I'm willing to do something a little bit crazy. In a few weeks, I'll celebrate 18 years of being your pastor. And 18 years ago, I came here to Atlanta to interview for the job. You all can laugh about it because Martha was there, Barbara Summers was there. They all know what that interview was like. Yeah. We talked for hours about God's blessing. And when I left this place from that first interview, I went home to my former pastorate in Minneapolis and I went to the board and resigned. And they looked at me and said, you're resigning? Did you get a job? Nope. Where are you going? Atlanta. You're going to Atlanta and they don't have a job. What are you going to do there? I'm going to be the pastor of the church there. Like, and, but they haven't offered you a job. You're going to Atlanta and you're quitting here, Uh, this is out of the norm. This is a little crazy. This is a little bizarre. No, this is faith. 
And so I waited. And though the interview team had interviewed me, I waited for them to call for me to come and candidate. And I had given an eight-week uh, lead for the congregation of my uh, resignation. In eight weeks, I was going to be without a job and no salary and no paycheck. And week two went by, and y'all didn't call me. <laughs> week three went by. Mm -mm. I was sure in week four you were calling. You didn't. Week five, week six, week seven, and the phone rang, and I arrived on week eight. And you elected me as your pastor. Now, the previous congregation in Minneapolis goes, whoa, how do you quit a job not knowing you have a job? And I said, that's what the way that God works. In the miraculous, and when you move by faith, you march around those obstacles with trust. You don't need to say anything more than just trust. But on the seventh day, you shout. Hallelujah. You say, they called. I got a job. I'm going to Atlanta. I see I walk out in faith. And that's what happens within our lives when we're willing to demonstrate this kind of faith. It's driving faith that will take you places. You'll go somewhere. Now, I want to shout this out because I want you to understand that this is so important for our life. You got to have a key if you're going to have driving faith. You got to put it in gear if you're going to go anywhere with that faith. And you got to put the pedal to the metal. You got to put the press it all down. You got to get it and put it in G O all the way. That's what faith is partial faith, half faith, limited faith, so so faith, contradicting faith will get you nowhere. You'll be sitting like that little child rocking the steering wheel like this. You'll be looking for the keys. You'll be wondering where the gears are. You'll be wondering why your feet can't even touch the pedals. You see, you'll go nowhere. This is the story of our spiritual life, that we're called to be people with driving faith, that's moving forward, that's going somewhere, that's claiming the, the very promises that are there and understands this faith is founded not in a humanized God, but in a principle, yes. wisdom, truth, law. Amen.